Every action or behavior in this world first comes from an idea, whether we know it or not. And I think that when we look at the recent, some would say election interference, others would say miscarriages of justice that have happened in relation to the 2024 presidential election when it comes to Donald Trump standing in the ballots, both in Maine and also in Colorado, where, where the government bodies, the courts in Colorado and the Secretary of State's office in Maine, both struck him from the ballot, we have to really ask ourselves, what ideas influenced this behavior? It's an important question because if you think about it, a political system, more than anything else in the world, is uniquely concerned with the transmission of good and sound ideals to the populace. If they weren't, then if the political system is not bound by ideas and does not transmit those ideas by way of their actions, well, that system can lapse into a kind of tyranny or kind of authoritarianism. This is why in the founding generation, the founders were so precise and they were so ecumenical in their approaches where they took ideas from all kind of different traditions, from Hinduism, from Christianity, from French secular humanism, from the Enlightenment, everywhere, from ancient Greece, and they incorporated them into our nation because they understood the importance of guiding principles. So when a political system lapses in its guiding principles, what happens? The system ceases to work as it is intended to. It ceases to function in the correct way. And not only that, it then becomes susceptible to being taken in a direction that may not benefit the populace, may violate first principles, and most certainly may change the very identity of the government itself. This is what's been happening in America for the past 130 plus years, ever since the inception of the progressive era, ever since the invasion on American shores of Prussian European ideas that are decidedly anti-American and sought to centralize, control, and reduce American, American life to government power, reduce American life to statistical thinking, reduce American life to this idea that you need a state to control you. Well, this same kind of mentality, I think, is actually beneath the decisions to strike President Trump off the ballot in both Maine and Colorado. Hear me out. A lot of people will say that judicial activism is the great scourge of our era. And by the way, I agree with you. But judicial activism is just a colloquial way. It's just a modern day way of referring to what's been happening in American law and politics for over, as I mentioned, 130 plus years. And it's also a colloquial way of referring to the principle of law that has been used by progressives for so long to distort all kind of areas of American life, whether it be in the creation of the administrative state, which has increased the regulatory state as a consequence over parts of American life, where now you have governments going into far farmhouses in Iowa and recently in Pennsylvania, seizing people's property, taking people's commodities uh, in the name of the common good. It all goes back to a certain principle of how government should run and a certain idea between the relationship of private property and government and government ma mandates. It all goes back to that. So in order to ask the question, what ideas underlie the recent attacks against President Trump's standing as a candidate in America, we have to ask ourselves a more fundamental question before we can get to that question. What is the purpose of a law? Because both of the mechanisms that were used to disenfranchise Donald Trump and millions of Americans in Maine and Colorado were both executed by virtue of a law. So if law is the tool being used, we have to analyze the tool being used so we can actually see why is it being used this way. Many of us understand this is an incorrect use of law. In fact, it is illegal and it's anti-law, but still, under a certain theory, what happened to President Trump under a certain theory that I don't agree with is actually justified in its logical conclusion of this theory. So what, what is the purpose of law? Ask the, uh, the question, what is the purpose of law? And more importantly, what should the law be based on? Well, the purpose of law, if I'm going to look at it from a 30,000 foot perspective, is a few things. Number one, it's to, it's to ensure a safeguard of people in society who behave in ways that are moral, 
When I say moral, I don't just mean as a matter of sentiment that you think that wearing a long dress is moral and wearing a short skirt is immoral. That, that's not morality. That's subjective taste. And very often the great scourge of modern day thinking is that we oftentimes mix up tastes with morality, which is one of the great confusions which led a lot of people to a lot of pain. That's not what I mean. When I say moral, I mean the rules that are necessary for human interaction to exist in the first place that are located in the nature of things, that are located outside of society, outside of the government, that we then take with our minds and translate them into law and into government. So the law has to be based on that kind of first principle apparatus or else the law becomes arbitrary. If you can't base the law on something concrete like natural law or the first principles outside of society, then law simply is arbitrary whim exercised over people, and therefore there's no good reason to follow it. Absolutely not. And some may say, well, Christian, this is how it's always been. Well, no, it's just that a lot of people don't really think through these things. Law has always had a basis about human history, whether it be the divine right of kings. Law used to be seen as a deific force, a reflection of God's voice. Law used to be seen as a reflection of the community's voice. It's always, you will never find in human history any society that has a law that is not based on something because it's, it, it's, it's a contradiction for it not to be based on something. It has to be. Every house has a foundation. Everything needs a foundation. If it doesn't have a foundation, its existence is incoherent. <laughs> That's why abstract thoughts don't necessarily click a lot of people. So if law is meant to protect from people who behave in moral ways, it's meant to uh, ensure promises are meant to be kept as well. Uh, it's also meant to um, um, establish the functions of a government properly in a certain society. If law is meant to do all of those things, then wouldn't law be bound first and foremost to a consideration of those things, of those principles? Isn't law simply a matter of applying principles in a context that enables that, in this case, the constitutional context of the United States of America? Well, it should be. If you murder someone, you get arrested. That's not a matter of society. It's a matter of murder being wrong. If you steal someone's stuff, you get arrested. If you defraud people, you get arrested. This is what law is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be concise, it's supposed to be direct, and based on fundamental principles. Well. The progressives and the left have devised a different theory of law. Law is not simply based on executing the functions of government as prescribed by first principles. Rather, law is meant to be a tool to effect social change. I'll talk about that in a second. And then in addition to effecting social change, it's also meant to be a tool to promote certain ideas. So law in the progressive mind has gone from simply being a tool to enforce principles that are laid out before the law has even existed, discovered by smart men who understand philosophy, who understand proper political order, to now becoming a tool of whim that enforces and reflects the society at hand. This is the reality of the progressive mind when it comes to law. And of course, this reality is found in history through a very, very dark concept. And this concept is called sociological jurisprudence. This basically means that, and this is basically an idea hatched in the progressive era by progressives who do not believe that the law at the time was reflecting the desires of society and that the law was too far removed from society. In fact, the complaint of this time when it came to create this new legal principle, was that law was too focused on principles and abstract ideas. And the Constitution, this is another critique of theirs, was also too focused on abstract ideas, and that the law should instead reflect the society that it existed. Now, to someone who may be, uh, to some people, that may actually sound okay. Well, yeah, of course the law should reflect my society, of course. But the law reflecting society is not necessarily a good thing. In fact, the law of reflecting society can be a bad thing. I personally think the laws in Saudi Arabia that bind people, women and sexual minorities to a certain caste-like status is wrong, but it reflects their society. 
We shouldn't worry about a law reflecting our society. We should worry about a law reflecting sound thinking. And that was the problem with the progressives. They didn't care about sound thinking or principles as our founders conceived them. They didn't care about natural law, natural rights, and moral thinking. The progressives cared about advancing their temporary social agenda at the expense of anything, at the expense of a sound, stable, and concrete foundation of law, which is why they hatched this idea of sociological jurisprudence to justify uses of law that deviate from principles, that deviate from the Constitution, and instead reflect the desires of those who happen to will the law. This is what is called now judicial activism, but was then called sociological jurisprudence. The entire idea of a sociological jurisprudence is that the law is based on society and not on anything else. But if we accept that society changes hands all the time and society develops, but morality and the truth, they remain the same, then you can't have a stable and just legal system based on a changing and shifting foundation because ultimately, if a building is built on quicksand, it'll eventually sink. Many of us understand this. Now, many would say, Christian, where's the proof of this sociological jurisprudence? Well, actually, I'll just I'll show you right now. So in the justifications for Donald Trump's disenfranchisement, we see this principle reflected in both of them. So first, the main Secretary of State said, Secretary Bellows, in her justification for disenfranchising Donald Trump by fiat, she said, I conclude, I quote, I quote, I quote I conclude that the record establishes that Mr. Trump, over the course of several months and culminating on January 6, 2021, used a false narrative of election fraud to inflame his supporters and direct them to the Capitol to prevent certification of the 2020 election and the peaceful transfer of power. Now, she then says that I do not reach this conclusion lightly. Democracy is sacred. Keep out for, watch out for that. I'll, talk about that in a second. Democracy is sacred. I am mindful that no Secretary of State has ever deprived a presidential candidate of ballot access based on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. I am also mindful, however, that no presidential candidate has ever before engaged in insurrection. <laughs> uh, the oath I swore up to, to uphold the Constitution comes first above all, and my duty under Maine's elections laws when presented with the Section 336 challenge is to ensure that candidates who appear on the primary ballot are qualified for the office they seek. Now, many people have rightly pointed out there was no conviction, there was no due process, and so how could you make this claim? But those arguments only scratch the surface, guys. We need to up-level our thinking, upgrade our thinking, because the barbarians, the civilizational barbarians, who we are up against, are not people that can be fought with base-level thoughts. They can only be fought with advanced thoughts that burn like fire and scorch the foundations of their intellectual edifices to burn away what they have done to our country. So we have to embody the fire if we're actually going to make a change. Not only was this statement obviously not conceived of through any legal process, process is important, of course, but it's not the only thing. It was fundamentally based on the complaints of three people that came to the Secretary of State, if you know the backstory, and basically said, using the same interpretation, that Donald Trump shouldn't hold office, therefore don't let him on the ballot. They were using a sociological idea, a social sentiment, that Donald Trump is an insurrectionist and a terrorist, not a legal fact, to, in, to make a legal decision. Let me repeat, repeat myself. The main Secretary of State and the three people who came to complain to her about this, to get this, to ostensibly get him off the ballot, Trump, were using a social sentiment to, in, to affect a legal consequence. You can't mix oil and water. They don't mix in principle. And when they do mix, chaos happens. Well, this is the chaos right here. A miscarriage of justice undertaken ostensibly under the banner of the Constitution, when in all reality, this perverse the Constitution, because the reasoning used in this decision is fundamentally against the principles and the philosophy embodied in the Constitution, embodied in the 14th Amendment, and most importantly, embodied in the functions of any sworn officer of the United States. You swear to uphold the Constitution. That's not, what, that's not what's happening here. 
This is sociological jurisprudence exercised from an administrative position, of course. Now, this manifests differently. It can happen in the courtroom, which is more common, or it can happen in the midst of an administrative fiat. But the reasoning is simple. This is reasoning based on social sentiment, reasoning based on a partisan perspective, not reasoning based on first principles or philosophy or law. And in my opinion, by the way, the idea of common law has kind of exaggerated this problem because common law is basically basically allows for this idea of precedent and stare decisis is so called. And stare decisis is like this magical incantation that justifies even the most odiously unconstitutional and immoral things that you can imagine uh, by reading intent into the constitution that wasn't there, all in the name of precedent. So if precedent is your standard, then you really can't evaluate the law in its entirety. You can only evaluate what other people thought about the law. But if other people were flawed in their thinking of the law, and they use that to make precedent, you will continue to repeat their flawed decisions as you go on throughout life. <laughs> it's sociological jurisprudence, where, where principles are not the basis, but society is. In Colorado, the same thing. Uh, the same thing is seen in Colorado when the reasoning for the Colorado Supreme Court, and they said... Uh, that basically Trump violates Section 3 of the 14th Amendment on the same basis. It's the same exact argument. Now, I mentioned that they said that democracy is sacred. How does that play in the sociological jurisprudence, you ask? Well, very simply. If you have this social idea that you're using to make a legal decision, you've already corrupted the system. But if you have further social ideas that you think should be reflected by that system, well, the system is already corrupt. The guardrails are broken. You can basically just insert that ideology into the system and have the system reflect that idea. This is what the left has been doing for decades, rhetorically and legally, but especially rhetorically, when they say that America is a democracy. And then a bunch of people will jump up and say, well, it's half true. We're a Democrat or Republic. <laughs> But in all reality, if you read the Federalist Papers, if you read the writings of Thomas Jefferson, if you have studied the founding generation, if you understood the philosophies that actually formed the debates of the Constitutional Convention, if you understood what was actually going on, you would know that America is a classical Republican state, or at least it was when it was founded. Now it's more of an oligopoly and an oligarchy and an authoritarian state, but when it was founded, it was a classical Republican state. What does that mean? Well, the word republic comes from the word res publica, which is Roman, and it basically means there is a scheme of representation within the structure of the government, and then there are also mediating forces within that structure that balance out power. It was basically, the, like, the translations like a government for the people, but not for the people as in the people decide, totally. It's like for the people as in they, there is a structure that they can interact with to affect political decisions. That's the model America is based off of. And just because you think that model has some relationship to democracy in terms of voting or selection does not mean it's true. If an if a airplane and a car have wheels, does that mean an airplane and a car are the same thing? No, not even a little bit. There are two different categories of things. They have the same function. Airplanes can help you travel somewhere, and so can cars. But that doesn't mean they're the same thing. Their ethos, their genus, their literal internal functions are different. The internal function of a republic is different from that of a democracy. So much so that the emphasis of a republic, and if you look at it philosophically, is not placed on the masses. It's placed on the structure. And that emphasis is then placed on the principles that undergird the structure. So a republic is actually the only form of political order. Do you hear me right now? The only form of political order that literally allows principles to breathe as they are meant to breathe. Whereas democracy rejects principles from the offset and assigns a value to whatever the numerical proportion the majority says. It's a utilitarian nightmare that enables almost anyone and everyone to just do whatever they want if they have enough popular support. It's ruled by popularity, it's ruled by the mob, and it's ruled by moral anarchy. That's what democracy is. So no, when they say that this is a 
When, when the Colorado Supreme Court panel says that America is a sacred democracy, do you know what they're saying? They've already used sociological jurisprudence, judicial activism, to corrupt the system further. They've already used social sentiment to inform the decisions. And now they're trying to literally me remake the system in their minds to even further justify what they've done. But beyond that, justify other things that would be absolutely unacceptable under the context of a republic. <laughs> this is rhetorical, intellectual, moral, and political manipulation and wizardry at the highest levels, and many of us aren't seeing it because we're so caught up and bound up in denouncing the deep state when we don't actually understand how the deep state operates and where it gets a legitimacy from. The deep state derives its legitimacy literally from these corrupt principles that were enshrined in our constitution, oh, not constitution, but that were enshrined in our society over 130 years ago. And maybe even a little bit back further from that. That's how it operates. That's what's actually going on here, people. It is happening in front of your eyes. And your influencers are not guiding you towards the truth. The truth is, President Trump is just a, the latest victim of this system of social sentiment elevated over law. This system of popular, popular, popular opinion elevated over sound thinking. President Trump is simply the latest victim. We have a choice, America. Will we understand this fact very well and then still just rag on about how we need to change hands in the government? We just need to reform. Or will we undertake a revolution of the mind and undergo a massive intellectual reformation of how we see the government and then allow it to translate into political and social action to correct this system that has deviated so far from its original foundations that, quite frankly, it seems to me, as a constitutionalist, as someone who admires Jefferson, as someone who is Jeffersonian, to be patently unrecognizable. The choice is yours, my friends. Like this video, come on this video, share this video, subscribe to this channel. Be sure to also, you want to help me, donate to my my Patreon, PayPal, my locals, join my locals. All that is in the comment section down below. Join my Discord for some good intellectual conversation. Study history, my friends. Study political philosophy. And most importantly, please, please, please stay pensive. Bye, guys.